I'm delighted to introduce our, our poet tonight. Uh, Maxine is the author of uh, three books of poetry, Toluca Street, Black Loam, and her latest, which is Undone. They're all back, back here, and so they'll be uh, available for sale uh, after the reading. She is co-editor with David Trinidad of Holding Our Own, the selected poems of Anne Stanford. Her poems have been widely published in journals such as Agni, the American Poetry Review, Ironwood, the Massachusetts Review, Plowshares, and the Virginia Quarterly Review. And her work has received various prizes, including the Agnes Lynch Starrett Poetry Prize, the Oregon Book Award for Poetry, a Pushcart Prize, and the Lyre Prize. She has taught at Lane Community College, Lewis and Clark, and most recently at Reed College. And I was talking to her a little before the reading, and so when she taught at Reed, she has been staying down the road, basically. And so she had uh, knew something about Milwaukee. She was at, uh, at Wordstock. She read at Wordstock, and I, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to hear her, her reading at Wordstock. So I'm very much looking forward to this. Would you join me? in welcoming our poet for tonight, Maxine Skates. Thanks, Tom. It's, um, it's wonderful to be here. All the poets I know who have read here previously have had a very good time, and um, I'm, I'm just... Uh, the setting is wonderful, and this seems like it's going to be, uh, you guys are going to be a terrific audience, so I'll get going. I, I did read it at Wordstock the other day, and uh, at the end of the reading, David Beispiel asked, uh, I read with um, uh, Carl Adamczyk, and, and he asked us who, who were the poets we went back to again and again, <laughs> and I, I named uh, Cesare Pavese and, and Adrian Rich, who uh, was just, is one of the National Book Award finalists today. And, uh, but then I went home and I thought, oh my goodness, I, I didn't say Anne Stanford, who's select, who was my teacher, <laughs> and, and whose selected poems I edited. And uh, so I, I would like to, to begin with a, a couple of poems of, of Anne's. Um, I cut my teeth on these poems. The first poem is called well, <laughs> I've lost it. Isn't that amazing? Okay, I'm going to read um, two poems. And the first poem is called The Prophet. In the 15th year of the Emperor Tiberius, he hunted hives of wild bees, breaking open the hollows of wood or bone, seizing the sweet marrow. Quicker than grasshoppers, he crunched wing and belly. His face gnarled under the sun. At night, he crawled under a goat skin. The air was thin out there, the stars big as melons, the brook for water or washing in, or to cleanse an occasional stranger of his wickedness. His hair matted, his dry beard bristled away from his jaw. Ravens flew by sometimes. Small groups of men he shouted to came, bringing others. Clearly, the world couldn't go on like this. Uh, Anne was uh, uh, from California, and many of her poems locate themselves in the landscapes of California, which is a, uh, and a, a really a, a, a landscape that my mother, who was born in California as well, uh, knew as a child, and she was the same age as Anne, or is. Um, and it's a, it's a forgotten world, and this poem addresses that. It's called The Walnuts. There shine always the bright tops of the grove, and within that forest, mysteries of birds. In the autumn, the clear crackle of leaves, and the walnut pickers, dark-skirted after them, the gleaners. Trees, trees were everywhere, out of the banks of a foggy morning. Outside the windows, the sweet trees leaned, tasseled in spring, in holy burst of leaves. And the oats made meadows of the early year, with nodes for whistles, the juice sweet and thin, 
grown high to bend into rooms, and yellow flowers hung over the spicy tunnels under the trees. There the grove hanging forever real in the air, and I an exile knowing every turn, and turning home, and lost in the dazzled road, the strange swept premises, and the great trees gone. Those were wonderful poems when you were just coming to poetry to, for the first time. They were huge. Um, uh, this is a poem called Vice. Um, and I, probably we've all been in that situation where we're, someone is offering us something we shouldn't have, but it's impolite to refuse it. When the waiter brought the almond liqueur as courtesy to our table, I hesitated, remembering Augustine's sin the one rewarded by nothing, neither the delicious anticipation nor the fall. But the fragrance of a flowering orchard told me my sin would be rewarded if I took my first drink in 20 years. And even as my chorus chattered, did the work I'm too lazy to do. This one hates me because I'm a drunk. This one forgives and says, I sought the spiritual in the spirit's clear distillation. And this one suggests the timing is right. I knew enough to know they all could be wrong. And when I reread Augustine just now, I found out how much I'd misremembered. As a boy, he'd stolen pears fit only for pigs, yet ate them anyway. He wanted to taste forbidden fruit, and so did I. My almost sin lived for its moment with the ringing bells, wild horses, and lush tremulos accompanying a fall. And when the music faded, I saw two of us were there, me and you, the one I will not hurt, who drank my flowering orchard for me. This is a, uh, the title of this poem is Magritte, and it's uh, one of the paintings where there's light above the treetops and it's dark below the treetops. It's two worlds. Magritte. Above its dark, sky still play pale blue with clouds, but the trees eat light. Below their massive darkness, a street light already lit the trees alive in two places. We live below. Here's the pig in the muddy barnyard with geese and dogs, or the pig rooting for food in a field of stinging nettle and bed straw, bathtubs and flung tires. Here's how a man lifts a split pig, headless, fore and hind legs still hooved from a refrigerated truck. He wears a red sweatshirt, flips the hood over his hair, pushing up to lift it from the hook. Now his ungloved hands are on the wheel, cigarette glowing between index and middle finger, window expertly cracked for the flick of his ash. He drives past golden dates hanging from palms, black figs and rosy pears, a whole orchard cut back, newspaper bundling each wounded stump. Out of time or place, Magritte's streetlight cast its circle on the deserted street. Everyone has gone home, and what rises is the first world, childhood, where I am expert at nothing, lone passenger already hurtling along the tracks, looking out this window at grapes, groves of singed apricot, alive through drought and ready for harvest. In Los Angeles, the iceman hooks, hooks ice out in the alley, heaves a blue chunk onto my grandparents' back porch. This is the brightest light, only a few steps past the red agave, into the shadows, the darkness, a fire burning in the old stove deep inside the house. And this poem is called Bucket. Um, I was telling Paul Ann how delightful it is to have this broadside. I've never had a broadside. <laughs> and I'm so pleased. 
a bucket of ashes, the oak, the maple, heart of the cherry, red grain of the fir, all burned to drift in the bucket I carry. The big dog is in her small box on top of the piano, stray bits of bone, ashes, my father, too, among thousands of white markers, my ashes, the mark on my forehead made by the thumb when I kneel by the stove, what I take away, tend, last night's coals left to stand in the rain, Nothing tethered now, char on wind, not the hammered gold leaf or a vest of stars, not Piaf or Schubert, Schubert or poor Balthazar, the mule whose life was given only to labor. These ashes, my bucket. As a friend said, that was a given poem. It was a given poem. Uh, I was a, I'd been away from home for a couple months and I was... I was happy to be back with the stove. Um. <clears throat> Not there. Sometimes late at night, around 11.05, when I'm watching the local news, reporting traffic accidents and meth lab bust, and the reasons for the smoke that has sealed the city in a breath-ending autumnal haze in midsummer, I cannot lift myself. I'm not there. Then it could be any year, but probably the early 60s, 63 or 64, a Friday night. I'm watching Johnny Carson or Steve Allen or maybe Jack Parr and Judy Garland who is swinging her legs from a stool, half singing, half crying. The jets are screaming overhead and in the intervals after they pass, the neighbors are arguing again and it doesn't matter which house because they all do. Big John and his nameless wife, Julia and Ted, the Smiths, Rosie and Bob, or Lynn and Jack, the ex-Hells Angels who have settled down with their four kids. They all pretend they can't hear what the next is yelling, but I'm the one who hears nothing. My mother is sleeping and my father has left for good. And all the years I was not there when my father was are gathered in the haze of aftermath, of disconnect, and I'm still not there the way kids aren't when they can't do anything about what is happening. So instead, watch the bird dissolve into the corner of the ceiling as nothing continues to happen. Certain everything has happened before them, as I know everything has happened before me. And all of it, the war, the harm my parents visited upon each other evenings after work and the long days of the weekend has left me untouched, a miracle, living in a sheath of numbed, stunned light. I will wear years into the future where I will overhear a woman in a drugstore telling the pharmacist how a drunken driver has killed her child. And though I am sorry and understand she hates all drunk, I know I am not the drunk who killed her child. I am not there, or even trying to be. But soon I will awaken, knowing I have been absent so long, I am in danger of never returning. Then I do begin to wonder where I have been. And all I can tell you now is that time has not begun. And though I can't explain how it did, maybe some clock slowly began to wheel when I did remember how one night I let the steering wheel slide out of my hands, the car beginning its slow drift toward the slough, just for the sake of seeing how it felt, maybe for the sake of ending the not-thereness. But mostly, I don't feel that way anymore just those few minutes late at night when I am tired and for a moment outside, and then life resumes in a kind of flooding that I recognize as my lifetime, broken as anyone's, the pieces floating up, the one that knows I could have been that drunk, the weedy smell of the river in late afternoon, the crickets humming the day's small aches and pleasures in this my present, which if I've learned anything, I've learned is never possible without the past.
<clears throat> this is a, a poem about um, my father. It, uh, <laughs> the Eugene Register Guard reviewed my book and said that all that it was really focused on on, on my father. I don't think it's a book that's a, a, about my father. My father is in all of my books, and and he's a. My father was a, a, a sad person, a, a person who went to war and never came home, basically. Um, although he did come home and, and, and made those around him pretty unhappy and was pretty unhappy himself. Uh, this poem is called Clean. Years now since he died, so when I pass two guys in a driveway, one tinkering the oil filter, the other on his back under the car, I remember how sometimes he took me to the water and power yard down on first, engines revving in the garages, and the yard full of men and the enormous Peterbilts they drove hauling transformers north, a job which meant dirt under the fingernails, dust in the pores, ground into work clothes washed by my mother in an endless cycle, flying stiffly from the clothesline, clean, starched by sun, wind unraveling worn threads at the pant and shirt cuffs, then grease-stained, sweat-stained when they came back again. The boots, the socks strewn, navy blanket on the good chair to receive him slumped on Friday night when, for a few short years, he'd still awaken Saturday morning full of ambition. Out in the backyard, he rigged a shower to wash sand from my brother's lean body when he came home from the beach. He tied back shrubs, scoured the shadows of each flowering bush off the stucco of his little house. Utilitarian, he built a fence from scraps of iron pipe. He tried to train ivy to it, but while he was at work, we swung through on our own monkey bars. After he died, I found a box of photographs, the men, the cranes, lowering sections of a bridge into a river the huge trucks would cross to bring us power. He wanted clean, he wanted order, but he couldn't get free of what haunted him, thick it into something winged so he could fly across. And finally, he stopped trying. The last year, the year before he left, he didn't bathe for months. The smell sickened us, oddly sweet, then cloying, a decay, belt slung under the belly of beer and Jack Daniels as his ruined body passed through the room. Um, my father was in the CCC, as were, were, was my Uncle Carl, and, and my Uncle Carl and my Aunt Mildred moved up to Oregon, the uh, same year I did, 1973. Um, they didn't actually work in Cal. I think that my father worked in California, but I kind of put him in Oregon. <laughs> Derelict state. Rusted troughs stacked in a barn barnyard, chocolate lad. Whoops, let me try again. Rusted troughs stacked in a barnyard, Chocolate lab pups for sale. Hand-littered signs atop barren fruit stands. Junked yellow caterpillar cabs. Boarded cafes. All of this will pass away. The boy on a bike stopped at the edge of town, staring across a field. Teenagers who sprawl on porch steps in early darkness will find their way to the city's astral glow. Where on a summer evening, in the middle of their lives, they'll remember the quiet nights, how they could see the stars, days when they reached for the dusty shine of blackberries in the August sun, and why they left, the mill shut down, gas stations closed, library gone, life slowed, aqueous, a whole town drowning, submerged by loss. Even the children go quietly hungry, unnoticed, unremarked upon. The way my old aunt who live here, lives here says, no one can know if my uncle and father first met in the CCC, since both are dead and married to the earth just as rivers marry. 
a confluence of five rushing into a wave that hit a charter boat broadside on the undredged bar at the mouth of the bay, so much untended, a covered bridge collapsing into a thousand splintered pieces, plunging a man and his grandsons broken into the creek below. In Lieberg, you can still see the WPA murals on the wall of the dam, poverty harnessed, the river tamed, but the salmon already going, and the years when Uncle Carl and my father learned to drive cat, huge blades upending roots and cutting roads, learned to do what seemed would never come undone. Uh, this poem is, is, is called Surrender, and in part it's a, about going to visit my aunt at, at her, her, what I assumed was her deathbed. I think she was um, 89 at this point, and she had decided that she was going to have um, a valve replaced in her heart. Everybody was trying to, to uh, tell her not to do that. She didn't have any kids, so she leases <coughs> nephews, sisters, trying to tell her not to do that. So finally she pulled the phone out of the wall. Um, in her hospital room and went ahead and did what she wanted to do and she lived another five years. <laughs> Surrender. It was the way the men had gathered around the stumps, how they had chained them, hooked and dragged them by tractor to the largest which would not be uprooted. And then the burning, the slow blackening by the green Lostine late in September. Trucks circled and water sloshing in the rusted towers as fire traveled the gnarled pathways deep into earth, world golden and slipping away that brought me to my aunt's bedside. I was ready then. I knew the way to death. I'd seen the brick building where they'd left the five-cent knee-high sign. I'd reached into the red cooler for cream soda in the liquor store where my father worked his second shift, and I knew another of the old ones was going. Or maybe it was the wooden roadside crosses, the plastic flowers, the unlit candles for Kimberly and later Jake, the way the deer and goats stood high on a cliffside overlooking the interstate like an ancient petroglyph that pointed to her passage. I was cooing by then, following the riff she sang. I heard her hurt, 88 check, chest cracked and stitched, her valves replaced, part pig, part calf, her eyes closed as she called her sister out of the wind. Did she hear us calling her? I don't know. I was confused, telling her to go on when I might have meant go on over. But yesterday she laughed and told me she'd spent one of those long days at a bar in Long Beach, tossing back at least three shots of Johnny Walker. This, as she bickered with her sister, so familiar, a cloud of pipe smoke from the old house on Toluca Street in 1956 or 57 enveloped me. And when her dead husband's last remaining brother entered the room, bowed and kissed first her hand, then mine, I thought they'd all been resurrected and didn't know why I'd been so ready to say goodbye. What was it I wanted to move on to? I thought of each white heron I'd seen standing in the reeds, and one in particular in the Applegate River, its patience as it waited for the flit of shadow, and how alone in mid-afternoon I listened to Callus, wondering if I could say why, since I know nothing about opera but the rain, the tears, and then I knew if asked, I'd say it's because she sings me down the dark corridor where the roots are glowing. This poem, um, I, I remember I, I wrote this poem uh, at, at Caldera up in the mountains where I had a, a residency um, several years ago. Um, it was the year um, the first spring after the big burn up there. And it, it was really a, a rather a, amazing time to be there because so much was growing back on what appeared to be a, a blackened uh, 
landscape. Uh, some, oh, there's, so there's some reference to the burn in the poem. The poem is called in, in Spring. In spring, when the frogs sing and mate, you think of Russia, wild, fecund, bursting from winter, the carriage wheels turning and echoing a long afternoon with a Russian novel. The memory of the novel and the afternoon becoming one as layer upon layer of afternoons settle over you in the story of a lifetime, the gut of unknowing always just at its edge. Until one afternoon, having fallen asleep, you waken afraid, something flitting, the hills amber, light diffuse, and you remember the fire, the burning trees of last August, and your uncle long ago pointing to the street light in front of your house. He tells you that each night he turns the lights on all over the city, and when he asks if you can tell time yet, you understand you will tell time, no evening by one man turning the lights on. Just as you know, if you stop following this thread of memory, all else will fall away, the way it did the afternoon you put your dog to sleep at the mouth of the woods. And though the vet had said she might startle, when the needle entered her vein, she did not, but slipped into it, went peacefully, and you were lost. So chert enters, so psalm, and the dream while your children are well-formed eight-year-olds, curiously slick like newborn colts with the afterbirth of yearning. As the horse lifts his head over the fence, the long bridge of his nose all a white blaze, blaze so loved by little girls reading stories of horses, they imagine naming their horse Blaze, because they do not yet know this horse is horse, is all horses, horse lifting its legs, pulling the chariot on the Parthenon frieze, amber horse on the cave walls of Lascaux, horse swimming, black legs churning green water, horse pulling the carriage in Russia, not just one horse, as your Russia is not your Russia at all but one fire kindling the next, the hillside behind the corral burned, and by the lake the trees charred to the shoreline, the lake which seen from above might be a blue coin, alms dropped in a beggar's basket of singed hills, the wind pushing its choppy water through twilight, carriages rumbling along the still soggy roads in Russia, where you lie down next to the grief of old aunts and governesses who have no children, where the serfs bend in the fields planting summer wheat, and at the end of the day fall sleeping on dirty piles of straw, their, hut, their huts clogged with the smell of afterbirth and cabbage and unwashed bodies, smells never recorded in the translations you love. And here, one girl reads by the fire, the girl taught by the good governess who saw her carrying a book she knew she wanted to read. Um, it's, I, I love reading in places that have anything to do with libraries. Uh, my mom worked in the LA Public Libraries for uh, 25 years and I, I don't think that I would have come to books the way that I did w without the libraries. I, I know that when I was a little kid, I was having trouble learning to read, so my mom went to the children's librarian and came home with the books that, that she thought would get me interested in reading, and it, apparently it had some good effect. Um, so, and my mother is tough. My mother is 93. This book is for her, in part. It's also for my husband, but my mother's happy because her name comes first. <laughs> I asked her if she might it. She said, no, not as long as my name come first, comes first, I'm, I'm okay. Um, this, uh, I'm trying to decide which, I'll, I'll read uh, a poem called Her Voice. I don't think I've read this one yet. Um, Her Voice. Early yesterday, on my way to catch a plane, the wild cherry blossomed and the yellow gorse. And when I spoke, I heard my mother's voice on another morning, 
fifty years ago, when she roused me before light and wrapped me in a blanket to make the journey downtown with my father, where he'd drop us at my grandparents' on his way to work. In that house of dust and silence, she whispered with her sister, figuring, I know now, a way out. This morning, I walked down Maine to Water Street in Kent, Ohio, where spring has not arrived, salt underfoot because it's snowing, a bleakness the West does not understand. Stopped at a drugstore and bought a Times, then found a deli and a cup of soup. In the motel parking lot, the jackhammer is rattling. The garbage trucks came at 3 a.m. to empty the dumpster, so I know they won't be back. Blocks away, the train whistle calls every two hours, a comfort as it is at home. I came here to talk about work and poetry, though it was my mother who labored as I have not. Today my friend will show me her house. It's yellow, her dog is black, bearish with winter, and the tree outside her window, she tells me, will cast its amber light in autumn. The birds are singing a little now. I used to go into the woods with my old dog. She'd carry her ball, I'd push the wheelbarrow, and while she rooted in the stream, I'd lift large stones, proud that I could heft them. My mother's voice on that morning, its timber of resolve, is a small tear through which she slipped in time. She's 86, still lives alone, and will not cross a picket line. She used to say she could do the work a man could do, her hands are large, still stronger than mine. Twilight. I cannot make you happy. Months and years go by, and I believe I've done my work, but you are not happy. And on the train, I am afraid of the woman sitting in front of me, so comp composed when the trip began, her iron suit, her matching bags. She coughs and coughs and is dissolving. I am afraid of flags flying from mills which look like fortresses, which like fortresses begin to look satanic. I love the Greeks because they believed the voices they heard were the gods telling them what to do. But who told me I could make you happy? This old ache, my undertaking, the workers wear orange vests, bright against the muddy river. Old pilings stub the mud flats, bare trees etch twilight, which you were the first to tell me, occurs at either dawn or evening. At dawn in the train yard, there was such emptiness, such disappointments in the empty cars, despite the spectacular graffiti as the loping shepherds roamed the perimeters. And all day I've seen the haphazard designs of wood piles and stacks of blue pipe, the tracks bisecting each town into Mattress World, an easy stop deli, the no-name empty storefronts miming something larger I can't see. This evening I try instead to recall the lessons of desperation, the lying under a tree hoping something would take me, the long drive into the countryside where every lonely farmhouse window frames a family sitting down to dinner. But none of this seems desperate anymore. A sturdy girl in a brown coat waves, a dog barks as we pass. Impatient, I forget the struggle, the wrenching time between, the letting go of each known thing for whatever lies beyond that door. There's a pond above um, the hillside in my house in Eugene, and, and for many years, one day my ha husband and I happened upon it, and then it seemed like a lot of years passed before we could find it again. Um, and both times it, it seemed like kind of a miracle that we'd found it. Now I can, I, it's not a problem, I know exactly where it is, but um, first couple of times it was, it was pretty magical. Residence. The pond fills in early winter. Trees bare around its edges. Last leaves from the wild cherry trees, yellow, fluttering. Years ago, I stumbled down the hill and found the pond in early spring, 
the trees full of robins, years before I found it again. But then, when I caught that glimpse, a certain radiance leapt out, something rumbling larger than the self. The way those old-timers at that first Christmas AA meeting said, you kids keep coming back, which felt like the first time anyone had asked, which felt as if once seen we were beholden, because maybe we'd seen something too, pulled toward them on a wave of nothing we could name. Just as these last months I've been pulled toward a lithograph I once saw of the robed physician bending over the cavity of the body, its array of organs, where I imagine he looks for the various humors, those weights and balances of the soul. But don't they slip away as easily as solvents from the train yard seep into groundwater in a neighborhood called, so beautifully, Train Song, which only says how easily anything transmutes, the body already a used thing, already broken in so many ways by the time the physician bends, even though it is by ordinary suffering, some say the soul is made or unmade, the death train, death song of the centuries chugging forward, spewing smoke, spilling over us as hazily as my mother's story of her brother, that slow uncle of childhood, who caught a virus with no name and something happened, as she told it, just above the ear, causing him, who had always been a happy boy, to never be the same. An explanation I understood so easily, the happenstance of whooping cough or scarlet fever, making lost the one true mystery we can see to name. The light within him snuffed and shuddered, a boy who had lost his soul, sleepwalking through the rest of his life. It's about to rain, the pond is filling, just yesterday, I saw a white-haired woman standing on the corner. I saw the slender girl she was, the way we see Daphne in the willowy trunk of a tree. And I thought, once I was a girl, liking so much the idea of what that might mean, a little surprised I had forgotten. I had. <laughs> I really had. I, you know, I'm like, wow. <laughs> Sometimes the revelations are far, fairly small ones, you know. <laughs> um, this is a poem called Before, and it's for my friend Bridget Kelly, who in a lot of ways has a lot to, to do with this book because she suggested that I write about undoing. Um, and this poem, in, a, in, a, in an odd sort of way, was a, 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 my attempt at a, a kind of uh, time travel poem, um, just thinking about what things would like, be like had not certain things happened. Before. We lived on Douglas Street after the fire, said the ants, the fire giving what followed a form, the way you enter a neighbor's life, her face stricken as she walks along the road. She's ill or sad, and you're hurting everything you know of her into the passing mirror of that face to answer why. Tall irises by the fence, the wisteria that died, dogs pawing the window, a dream that led you to her open door. Now she's gone, now early summer, Penstemon, Rosemary, Nutka Rose, each name a little mask of time departing. Now a dragonfly landing on a hammered star, blue jay squawking on the branch of the oak, send you back to the story you told yourself as a child, playing with blue feathers and grief, playing, and if I had not lived, as we all do, and if the thigh unbruised, the knee unscarred, and if we could turn time back, erase that message chalked beneath the spray-painted graffiti of a southbound train. Mama, your God has forsaken me. And if the train rolled backwards to a train yard hundreds of miles north, cars uncoupling, where a young woman stands about to write, 
Which forsaken moment would she choose? No wound, no plum falling, glistening with heat, no bulldozed olive tree, no girl dying each death that brought her here, no boy, no bomb falling named little boy. And now you drive the road at twilight, incising time, a plowshare cutting the unbroken earth, each of us an open door, the threshold we step across, reading Milton when the phone rang, bad angel falling as you pick it up. Before you cross, before things change, the moment we have left, the moment time begins. No plum falling, glistening with heat, no bulldozed olive trees older than remembering, no girl die dying, any girl, any boy, father, mother, no bomb named Little Boy. I'm going to read one more poem and then I'd like to, to read end with a new poem. Um, this poem is called The Giants uh, and it's, uh, it's about the men I grew up with. Out here, all darkness, stars overhead, I can finally see the giants. After all the years weighing dreams fragments, I can see how each small thing, dead bees, a girl touching her ear, rose petals in a pool of molasses, leads to something larger than a life. The way the eye follows a trail of stars, then sees first one and then another constellation against the dome of night. My giants, I can almost love them now, their hunger, like a piece of oak in the fire, eating every piece of wood around it. They ate everything. They left the bones scattered on the old brown sofa, the rabbit headless in the yard. They lumbered, light full on their shoulders, their hair backlit and flaming, birds and small animals fleeing as whole, anim whole families left uneaten meals behind. I know they can't eat me. I know them as I know that to a child I might be as large as they were. And when they fell, the distance of their falling was so great the blood flowed, the earth smoldered. And when they cried, their crying filled every room with their tears. And worst of all, when they left, they always came back. The jostling, the trestles quaking in those days of the giants, sowing their bitter gifts, their curses, their sour blessings, their hurled and their spilled and their shattered. What was it that ate them, the dream they couldn't see burning inside them, the questions they never asked, the tree under whose shadow they did not lie down? I can see them all that broke them, their shirts creased with sweat and rank oil when they climbed into the, trunks, the truck's cab at dusk, clutching the brown bag and the lottery ticket. Their feet rang out, their doors slammed, they trudged, they cried, they gave me these stars on a dark road, the rose book on a summer afternoon, the hooked thorns of the climbers, the ramblers blooming over walls and outbuildings, blooming over their graves. They gave me everything I wouldn't have known to love without their whine, their roar, their terrible noise. Just rescue these things from falling off here. Um, this is another sort of given poem, uh, The Gift of the Beehive, The Gift of the, the Bees Which Descended on Our House Last Summer, or this past summer. So the poem is called Hive. I'm sitting by the window, listening to the hum of the workers doing their jobs thinking of the kindness of the ER nurses at 4 a.m., when just as we were walking to the exit after watching the reassuring rhythms of Bill's EKG announcing his heart had nothing to do with whatever virus or food poisoning had sent us there. The partiers arrived with the stoned kid who had something in his eye no one could see, though he was certain it was a needle finding its way into the labyrinth of his brain, and how on the way back to the motel we stopped at the all-night drugstore 
where on what was now Sunday morning, the security guard and the cashier nodded politely and went on talking about Jesus, who once said, is the way. But back on the boulevard, Jeremy Irons in his red pope's cloak stared down from a billboard for the Borgias, who never imagined they'd be a TV series. <laughs> Though such greed and evil, if history is accurate, do seem perfect for our time when mostly it does seem the way is lost. And had the Borgias lived now, they surely would have hacked into every available voicemail box as a means to whatever ends they knew were their reward, just as the Murdochs, Murdochs have, thereby distracting us with downfalls they'll no doubt bounce back from, unlike those who walk the tightrope of every day with no room to fall. The woman wearing a maid's uniform, for instance, as we made our way back to the motel that morning, standing carefully apart from a man slumped against a building as she waited for a bus to take her to work, or those who, unemployment run out, do fall away, unaccounted for by whatever statistics pass as history, which as a kid I thought was over, already done, Though I understand now, it's that we can't see ourselves in its midst, so wait for someone else to make sense of it, comfortable as we are with courtly intrigues, where then, as now, the drone of ordinary life goes unheard, until something forces us to listen, the humming growing louder and louder, as it did last week, when finally we had to look up at the swarm spiraling above the house, descending, heading toward us, only to disappear into the woods as if they'd heard our plea to land elsewhere, become someone else's problem. <laughs> but last evening, lugging hoses, I heard them again, looked up at those stragglers crossing late sunlight as they headed home to the beautiful braid of themselves, hiding the combs of their pulsing hive under these eaves. I'm told that you that you you might like to ask questions. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions you might you might have. Yes. What has motivated you to put your thoughts into uh, not only poems but into books so that we can all know what's going on in um, your mind? Well, I, I can't, by this time, I, I can't imagine life without writing poetry. Um, poetry sort of gave me a life. Um, it, it gave me a way of making something out of, of my own life, but uh, uh, certainly the impulse came from trying to make something out of the lives of my family. Um, it was very important for me to be able to try to make sense of, of my family's lives, which were often not terribly happy. Um, so I was lucky enough to, to, to find a teacher who encouraged me. Um, and I, I remember, I remember when, I, when I, I told her, <laughs> I said, OK, I'm going to be a poet. This was Anne Stanford. And she looked at me, and she said, there's not much money in it. You know, as, I mean, you could see the sort of look cro crossing her face, like, <laughs> what have I done? You know, I, <laughs> this, this may not have been the best thing to do. But it's, it, it's you know, uh, it is my life. I, 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 don't, I can't imagine a life without it. Um, so I guess that motivation is still there to make something out of everything around me. Hope that answers your question. Well, no. Why, why, why into a book? Why not a journal personally? Um, I think I wanted to be heard. I think it. I. I think it's as simple as that. I think what I what I wrote, I wanted to be heard. So when do you write? Do you write every day? I try to. I write in the morning. In the morning. Yeah. And I and I try to if I'm if I'm teaching I I, I, I lived at Brochy House last time I was at Reed and I lived in this tower out there, and uh, I I tried to write every morning before I I uh, went off to teach. That's not always the case when I'm teaching the full time, but um, most mornings 
seven days a week up down there. <laughs> yeah, so. How old were you when you wrote your first poem? Uh, I think I actually pr probably yeah, somewhere between 12 and 16, I suspect. I think I, I know I wrote, uh, had a creative writing class in high school, so I was 16, but I think, yeah. And I didn't know it was a poem. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much for, what? What drew you to the book that you edited? Um, how, did, how did that come about? Well, it, it, Anne had died in 1987, and, and both David and I knew that David Turnadan, who was also, a, he's a very fine poet, and uh, it, we knew that she had, in her last years, completed a manuscript at, which was not published. Um, and we both wanted to do something with, you know, we, we've owed her such a debt. I mean, she took us into our, her homes. We were, you know, we were working class kids who did not have books in our own homes, though I had a mother who worked in a library. But she took us, she, you know, she taught four classes in a, in a state college, and then she, she'd take us into her, you know, into a night class in her home on top of that. And we, we felt that we really owed her a debt. And, and we were, um, so delighted when Copper Canyon decided to publish this book, it, and the book was very well received. She was a, a poet who's, who, you know, she was widely known. She had just stopped publishing, which is a sad fate for any poet. So that was, it was a labor of love, basically, and gratitude. Yes? I noticed you read your new poem from a journal, and I'm assuming that's a hand, is that a handwritten no, no, no. It's a, it's just a, it's just a manuscript. It's a manuscript. It's a new manuscript. So it's okay. just a it's a clasp thing. Okay, I was really impressed because I write also by hand. My first, my first. Oh no, no, that wasn't the first. I would never to read it. No, 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 no. I wouldn't either. So those are all typed up. Yeah, yeah, they're all typed up. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Don't be impressed. <laughs> many, many drafts. Yes. Relationship to animal nature, mm -hmm. and that many of your metaphors come through some kind of observation of, of an animal or, or an animal type. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a very beautiful relationship. Mm -hmm. um, would you care to respond to that? I'm, I'm aware of that. I've become more aware of it, and I'm even more aware of it in this new manuscript that I have. I, um, I'm, I'm a pretty solitary person. I've lived in the same house since 1976. I, I, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I love, I have dogs, I've had dog after dog, and, um, and I'm, I'm very happy with animals, <laughs> yeah. sometimes happier with animals than I am with people, you yeah. <laughs> know, I, I, I think we all know about that, <laughs> you know, I, I, I teach a class in my house on Wednesday nights, but last night it was on Tuesday because I was here tonight, and, and uh, somebody came in the door and she said, there she is talking to the dog. And, and I turned around and I looked and I said, yes, as you were talking to her dog, your dog. And then I looked and the next person came in and the next person was Carter McKenzie. And I said, as, and as you were talking to yours. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know what it is, but um, they, they're, actually I can tell you, I got my first adult dog when I was 34 or 35 and it was a really difficult time of my life. And I walked the hills with that dog for a long time trying to figure some things out. And it's kind of been that way ever since. You know, my husband gets, comes along too, but. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Cesare Pavese, and so few people know about him. Yes. How did you not find out about him? Were you studying Italian literature? Because he, he committed suicide. Yes, he did. Uh, I read his, um, his poetry. Um, in, in, in the American Poetry Review, the William Arrowsmith translations in uh, the early 80s. And then I went to, to Italy. I traveled abroad for the first time, and we were, we were living there. And I, and I try to always read the books of the country I'm living in. And I took his wonderful book, Hard Labor, with me. And it was huge for me because if, if you know, don't know this book, it's these wonderful nar narratives about life in the countryside. And it not only taught me so much about writing narrative poetry, but also it gave me a way to see some my own experience, 
you know, uh, I so I think I was really influenced by Pepe. I say. I think that's very uh, unusual because so few people, you know, know about him or have heard about him, and uh, he was very influential during his early years. Yes. With young uh, Italian writers. As a novelist as well. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So, yeah, so I seldom hear the name again. I thought, gee, what a treat. Yes, well, <laughs> if you don't know him, he is a treat. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> oh, okay, okay. That, no more questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Cool.